Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope, a podcast about business, well-being and chocolate. Hello and welcome to our latest episode of Hope and Patience. It's a treat to have you here. And if you're new to the show, the hugest of welcomes. Just to give you the heads up, if you sign up to the H&P newsletter, you're in with a chance of winning one of our chocolate bars. Did you read the other day about the resurgence of patterned wallpaper influenced by the rise of costume dramas like The Amazing Bridgerton? We've certainly all had oodles of time to stare at our four walls and ponder on making a change to them, haven't we? Our guest today is the epitome of craftsmanship and design with silk and rice paper wallpapers. She and her husband created their exquisite bespoke hand embroidered hand painted wallpaper company in 2005. And it's handmade in the truest sense as it takes up to 600 hours for one artist to complete one panel. Collaborations have included Savoir Beds, a 3D creation with Lalique and their Irondelle, and a sprinkling of clients, including award-winning interior designer Sophie Patterson and the LA Paris-based Timothy Corrigan, and hotels and eateries include Sir David Tang's China Tang at the Dorchester Hotel, the Goring Hotel, George Sank in Paris, the Fairmont in San Fran, and the China Club in Hong Kong. And how do I know our guest today? Through one of my favourite chocolate collaborations when I had my chocolate business. Their team designed the carton for the bespoke chocolate bar and it was just so divine, it made my visual senses drool. So time to introduce our guest, Lizzie Dae, co-founder of Fromental. Hello and welcome to H&P, Lizzie, and I hope I've managed to nail the pronunciation of your surname. You've done it beautifully. <laughs> I have to let you into a secret, lovely listeners, that Lizzie was giving me a quick pronunciation course before we kicked off. And yes, it was a, it was a challenge. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's as difficult for the French as it is for the English. <laughs> so Lizzie, we would love to have a brief snapshot into how Fromental was created. How, you know, your, your sort of early chapters and then to the creation with Tim, your hubby. Well, Fromental started because even as a child, all I wanted to do was to apply surface pattern in one way or another. It started when I was three and I disagreed um, quite vigorously with my mother as to the choice of wallpaper in my bedroom. And uh, she very wisely told me that um, in her house, it would be her taste, which in retrospect was beautiful. Um, but as soon as I was 18, I could go out and create my own wallpaper. So that's what I did. i always want I kept that always listen to your mother and um, I always wanted to make wallpaper in one way or another and my, my journey there was informed by you know art school and um, ver various things that just led me to that and decided in 2005 that it was it was it was time to do it ourselves and um, so yes Tim joined me we were we'd, we were already working together and so uh, we just just went for it and before this, Lizzie, so you did you you trained in fine art, graphic design. Um, I trained as a printed textile designer, so it was it was basically surface decoration, yes. And then, did you work for other people before setting up your business? I mean, yes, you... yes, I, I worked. I worked actually almost exclusively in the wallpaper industry um, for various companies, and learned a huge amount from from all of them. You know, different different aspects of the trade from all of them. I also was freelance. I also painted a lot and lot of murals. So you know, my training through different employers and my own freelance work was all really gearing towards starting our own business in wall coverings. And did you always know, did you have that sort of itch inside you that you wanted to do your own thing and you wanted to create your own business? Yes, I mean, in retrospect, I'm pretty unemployable by anybody else. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> I think that's, that, that's what happens, um, you know, people who, people who set up their own business, they're so single-minded, which is what you need, obviously. It does make you quite a challenging employee. <laughs> and when you met him... 
Mm-hmm. Was that before you got together, before you set up the business? Yes, absolutely. Actually, it was, it was both our first job. Um, Tim's you know, if you're just you know, a smattering of years older than me, not much. Um, but we both met in, in the fashion industry, in fact, um, a beautiful silk mill in Kent, which started a very, very long time ago. They had their own madder pits and they were block printing when they started. And um, we just had a passion for pattern, a passion for silk, a pattern for beauty. We met there, we were very, very good friends. And um, I just knew that we would always work together and we would be in each other's lives. So, you know, everything was just falling into place perfectly. And do you have children? Yes, yes, we do. We have a a little seven-year-old who uh, only reason to, to live seems to be to be in nature and draw. So oh, wow. I think we've done well there. <laughs> Very well. So how do you balance working together, living together and with your little child too? Well, weirdly, we all seem to share the same passion. I can't imagine not being with somebody or within a family unit that doesn't share a creative passion. We talk about it morning, noon and night. I, I can't imagine any other way of living or being. So you don't do you, you don't have a switch off zone. Never, never, <laughs> ever is there a switch off zone. That's, it's marvelous. That's amazing. All, entirely in it all the time. And um, Lizzie, hope and patience was was named after my two grannies, and I think they're oh, also two yeah two key virtues that we require to thrive in life and also mm-hmm. to build a business. Fromental is a really unusual name. Who? Or what? Did yes. you name your business after Lizzie? Uh, just like you, it's it's a family name. It was it's my um, father's my father's uh, mother's name. Oh, my wow. great grandfather Etienne Fromental. I remember him very vividly. He died when I was very young, but the name was so beautiful. It's very unusual, and it seems to me that the only people who have that name are my family. Um, it's a very, you know, and it seems to come from a tiny village in France called Fromental. I think that I thought the name was just really exquisite until I realized, of course, like my surname, it's quite difficult to pronounce. It is. I mean, it is another challenge. I would imagine there are quite a lot of people who say Fromental. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably yes. including myself. Yes, it's just a, uh, a mix of frenetic and mental. Yes. <laughs> so is that where you originate from, Lizzie, France? Well, my father is French. My mother is English. I was I was actually born in London, so um, I was very very lucky to be introduced by my mother at a very early age to the joys of the Victoria and Albert Museum, the British Museum. Uh, I'm so glad to have started here. We then moved to France, and I then spent the next fourteen years planning my my return to London. Is it in your DNA, the creativity? I mean, were your parents creative and, and mm-hmm. did their own thing? In fact, I'm the, I'm the third generation of women on my mother's side to go to art school. Wow. Um, my grandmother went to the Bloomsbury Art School for Girls, which I believe I might be very wrong. It sort of turned into Central St. Martins or something like that. I'm not, not quite sure, but I know she went to art school, studied millinery and photography. My mother went to Camberwell. Oh, wow. um, in the 60s and she she was taught by the greatest which is just extraordinary and uh, yes so she gave me my blessing her blessing I'm sorry um, to go to art school but to work incredibly hard and try to be the best at what I did that was her only caveat and do you have siblings I have no siblings, no, no, it's just me. So all the energies were poured into me. But not only is my mother an incredible textile designer in her own right, my godfathers were also a huge influence on me. Um, they're both a, a print artist and a textile artist. And my earliest memories is being, being in that world, being surrounded by textiles, being surrounded by pattern and being uh, surrounded by single-mindedness and very, very hard work to achieve what you need to achieve. It's not a dilettante thing. You really have to work very hard at it. I would imagine, and so focused and so patient. Where where would you say your work ethic comes from? Is it from your godfathers and your mother? or Yes, absolutely. And, and, and my, on my father's side as well, you know, that there are, my, my uncle is a very accomplished um, draftsman and sculptor. So, 
the very strong work ethic was always built into me from a very early age. And I saw that around me. The only way to succeed is to work incredibly hard at your chosen craft. Do you think it's hard work or do you think it's luck then that creates the sort of success side? I think there is, I, there's definitely both. There are de de definitely both. You, you do need, well, luck that you probably, you probably build your own luck by wanting it and to making things happen, not expecting them to fall out of the sky fully cooked, as we say in France. You know, it's, um, I think it's a mixture of both. And I think luck breeds luck. You know, you, you make your own journey that way. How easy was it to get kickstarted and to get your clients on board? I mean, you've, 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 your client, the list is mind blowing. I mean, you just have to look at what you create to have attracted <laughs> them, but. Well, I, I would say that that is very much down to Tim. I mean, we both worked in that industry before we started for Montal. So, and, and Tim is just so wonderful with clients. He really is just incredible. Um, he has a generosity of spirit and a kindness and an honesty that people really respond to and incredible knowledge. And so when we started for Montal, you know, he, 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 his name was already, you know, known within that sphere. And then, you know, clients turned to us from then on. So that, that, that was luck, but it's also down to his great charisma. Do you have different compliments that you bring to the business then? Oh, yes. I mean, we are both very creative. Um, Tim trained, in fact, um, at UMIST um, in weaving and um, I believe the science of production of textiles. So he really is, he has, you know, two heads in, in, that, in that respect. And he's you know, very focused. He understands sales. He understands the way business works. Um, and he could sit down and do marvels with an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> and I have none of those um, talents whatsoever. I'm just good with a paintbrush. But it's a very good balance that you've got going, obviously. I, I think we complement each other because we never try to step on each other's toes. And when we do, we sort of tussle out a design idea and we always manage to find a really good way of focusing two ideas and making them into a better one together. Since 2005, we've had quite a few um, sort of cycles in the economy. How, what would you say is your secret to weathering the storm of these sort of peaks and troughs? Indeed. I mean, when we started, it was just, just before the first uh, financial crash, if you will. It was, uh, we were very small, so we weathered it quite well in that respect because, you know, there was nothing much to lose. We were, you know, we were just starting and we managed to weather it because of our size. And now pickers of a slightly larger size and things being sort of more settled within the company and the way it's run, that managed, you know, we had, that really helped us um, weather this particular storm. And we haven't done badly. We've been very, very lucky. And also people have turned to interiors more and more, as you were mentioning at the beginning. Um, people have been looking at their four walls and seeing how can, they can live with beauty. So we have been very lucky and, and, and things are going well. And how did you cope with your, because a lot of your designers are international and your clients, how does it all work if you're, if you can't travel to see them and show <laughs> them samples? Well, the joys of Zoom, the joys of Zoom, the joys of DHL and FedEx and all of these wonderful courier systems. And um, I actually did manage to um, have some wonderful meetings in Paris. I just got back last night. Oh, um, wow. Gosh, I'm tired of that, escaping our little <laughs> it, island. It was quite a challenge. It was quite a challenge to go and quite a challenge to get back, um, but worth it. Worth it. Obviously, Paris is beautiful. And presenting wallpaper, presenting textiles, talking about these things are always wonderful in any way or form, but actually eye to eye for people to touch the product, mm. to see you interacting and to be face to face, nothing really is a substitute for that. And so that I was, you know, that was that was a really wonderful moment to actually to actually do that for the first time in a year. I know, gosh, I miss those physical mm. connections. Absolutely. But, I mean, your work is so intricate because it's it's needlework, isn't it? It's embroidery mm -hmm. on things like the finest silk and rice paper. I mean, how does that happen? Well, we do we do work with the most incredible craftsmen. Um, whatever skill is required, we will get the best craftsmen to to fulfil that. And yes, you know there, there there are people all over the world who have incredible skills and who have learnt it 
you know, who, whose life revolves around that. I was just wondering how your artists cope working remotely. Have they always worked remotely or has it changed since the pandemic? Well, obviously, we haven't been able to go out and see them, but that hasn't been a problem. I mean, these artists, a lot of these artists are on the other side of the world, so we oh, don't wow. really get to see them anyway. So that's, that has never really, really been a problem at all, no. Whereabouts are some of the artists based? Well, for the first type of embroidery that we have used, the, these are incredible silk embroideries from Sudro. Now, um, Sudro is, I would say, that it's the capital of silk embroidery in China. It is, it's, they've been using silk for centuries, embroidery for emperors and, and then Gosh. for very wealthy people and luckily for us and they're, they're in, you know, inc- incredible, incredible embroiderers. And so, you know, there, there's other, other places who have different styles and um, yeah, we just use the best from any country. And does that involve quite a bit of travel to go and find these artists? It, it did. One, I mean, once you have a, a really, really good little group, mm-hmm. you, can, you can manage to do it without travelling. And it's probably it's more environmentally friendly, I suppose, not to yeah. travel so much. <laughs> much. And they can interpret your vision. Yes. I mean, we have been working together for 15 years and we've got a, you know, a good way, a really good working relationship. Is there ever a limit on how many commissions that you can take on, given that it is so labour intensive? You would think so, but it <laughs> never <laughs> seems to stop. Really? No, it, it really does. It's you always think think when you're halfway through a very big project, my goodness, do I have got a second to actually fit in anything else? But you just, you know, you manage. I mean, anybody who has a life which is, is more than just contemplative knows that you do manage to cram things in if you have to. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that when you run your own business, I remember with the chocolate business, is I never said no, even if I took an order thinking, how the heck am I going to deliver? You, Absolutely. You sort, of, you sort of do, and, and each time you grow, and each time you learn where you could slightly improve it and fine-tune, I think. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And there's such a risk, isn't there, Lizzie, that if you say no, mm-hmm. then your your supply could dry up for some reason from a different area, and then you think, why did I say no? Because now, actually, I'm trying to yes. find work again it's absolutely i mean there, there there's always an element of fear mm. um which drives you forward the fear of saying yes the fear of saying no um you just have to just break through that barrier and so you're absolutely true. right ne- ne- never turn it down consider it very very carefully first before you turn anything down because um it might it might seem quite difficult at the time might seem quite challenging but there's always something absolutely fundamental that comes out of any challenge I think. Absolutely. Actually out of interest is your house full of pattern? Naturally. (laughs) Not enough walls. (laughs) Do you say you do it on a regular basis just think oh no I feel like this? Yes we change we we change we change as much as we can um, just because I I don't think it's boredom I think it's excitement of of seeing something else. Yeah we do change our paper quite frequently we are very lucky. Yeah, you are lucky. (laughs) So on the sustainability side, Lizzie, it seems that you tick many of the boxes with the nature of it being handcrafted Mm -hmm. and it's made to order. But would you share with us the sustainability around your materials? So the silk and the rice paper? Yes, absolutely. I mean, these are completely natural materials. Silk in, in itself is a very expensive material, so it's used very sparingly. We know the fact that everything is made to measure and tailored means that there is very little wastage. The fact that every order is made just for that particular place means that you're not running off thousands and thousands of meters of product. Mm-hmm. Everything is just made for that, they're, 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 there's just it's it's all about wastage and, and managing the resources that you have and being respectful of the resources. I mean, silk is an animal product. You, you can't forget, you know, what it is. So you have to be respectful of that. The the paper, what well, they call it, rice paper. Was, uh, some of it is made from the mulberry tree bark, which, which again is part of the um, the silkworms life cycle so a lot of these things have to be considered and we, d- we don't waste anything in our studios either you know we reuse we only use a small amount to do what we need to do we're very conscious of that 
Do you think with the silk that it will change? I mean, I'm thinking of, of um, things like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat with the burger side mm -hmm. of things. Do you think that's going to happen in the silk world? Very possibly. In, in fact, you know, a few years ago, if you looked at products which mimicked silks, they, it was very obvious that they were just trying to mimic silks. Uh, now, it's quite extraordinary how similar some of the man-made products look to silk. Of course, they will never have the same response to paint, the same luminosity. <clears throat> but in certain circumstances, yes, it, it, it would make sense to use um, some of these products. And in, in a way, they are quite sustainable because a lot of them are made by, from recycled products. And um, if they don't have the same USB as silk, then you just look at what USB they do have and work with that. So there, there are always alternatives. There are always solutions to a more environmentally friendly future. Yes. Have there been any areas of the business which has been more challenging to become more sustainable with? Yes. I mean, I would say air travel is the biggest one. Mm hmm. You know, uh, we have to we have to really think very, very carefully. How can we put things together to to ship um, in a more conscious way, not to send things every five minutes and try to regroup? And yes, we we, we do think about that quite a lot. And of course, you know, at, at the moment, air travel is is very restricted. So our travel itself has diminished considerably. And that is no bad thing. It's made us realize that we can work our business in different ways. Yes, I mean, Zoom has been a lifesaver, but it's also, are some trips really that necessary? It does make you think. And it's, you know, out of all bad things, a, a good thing does come out. Yeah, I think there have been several positives out of out of the pandemic, however bleak it's been for, Indeed. for so many people. Lizzie, what skill set have you required to build and grow from Antal into the global brand that it is? Blind optimism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard work, optimism, grit, just determination not to let go. And um, recently I've been thinking more and more about something that my grandfather used to say. And he, um, he had quite an extraordinary life, my father's father. And he was incredibly tough, a wonderful man. And he always said in French, il y a toujours une solution. There is always a solution. Just take a deep breath. There is always a solution. So I think that is what I'm taking in, in the next few chapters of our of Fromental. There's always a solution. Just on the aside, what was mm. extraordinary about his life? Because I, I love knowing about people's lives. <laughs> well, um, the family moved to Algeria in 1830 as uh, farmers. It was a very, very tough life. He wanted to, be, to continue being a farmer. They had a sheep, but he was very, very bright. And he went to the École Normale to become a teacher. Then the war broke out and he enrolled as a pilot in the Free French Army. And he trained to be a pilot. He was very young and was a pilot of a bomber. He got shot down, um, managed to escape, was made prisoner. This was just at the end of the war. He then managed to flee, you know, break out of the, the this prison of war camp when they were being marched from one prison to another, managed to get back. He had the Légion d'honneur and he was just, you know, then they lost a lot, obviously. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the independence, 1962, a lot of people, it was, it was very hard for France and Algeria in general. A lot of people suffered both sides and they started all over again. And it was this, just this determination to look after your family, to work hard and hopefully be rewarded for honest work. And I think that's really very, very important to look back at that and think, gosh, our forebears really had a very, very tough life. And they just did it with resilience and bravery and dignity. I think that's something to remember in all of our aspects of life without trying to be too drab and sad. But I, you know, I think it's grit and determination is a very, very good thing to have. It's absolutely true. What spirit he must have. And also that obviously has come down in your DNA. So I think that <laughs> I is so. vital. It's uh, fascinating, <laughs> really fascinating. So would you say that there have been any serendipitous moments with the business? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think they're every day. I was mentioning about luck before. I think once you have a little bit of luck or somehow something happens, it happens again and again because you're looking for it without, you know, openly looking for it. It just seems to happen more and more. It's an accumulation. It's like a snowball. 
Yes, we've met some incredible people just on the off chance, which have allowed us to explore one avenue or another of the company or a project and make great friends as well along the way. You know, it's, it's just been extraordinary that way. We've met some wonderful people who've become great clients, great friends, and who've moved our businesses in one way or another and moved us in one way or another. So, yes, serendipity is very much part of our life. Are you happy to share one of those moments at all, Lizzie? Well, I just a, a very dear friend. I will mention the interior designer, um, great talent designer, uh, Roger Thomas, who was the designer for all the Wynn casinos and now lives in Venice. <laughs> Lucky thing. It's very beautiful there at this time mm. of year, I believe. And just through just one or two little connections and just managed to meet him. We never thought we could. He was so sought after and we formed an instant connection and we worked with him for many, many, many years. And now he's a very dear friend. And, you know, that his orders were some of the ones that really kick-started our company. And not only, as I said before, it didn't just, you know, it wasn't, wasn't just business in a, in a wonderful way, but a wonderful friendship. So, yes, things like that, just chance meetings. So special. They sort of give you a tingle, I think, in your, they they're like glitter in your veins, aren't they, when they you are. have them? Absolutely, absolutely. So who would you say or what would you say has been the greatest influence and why? On the company or personally? Either, both. <laughs> Free reign, Lizzie. <laughs> oh, it's, there's so many things. I mean, yes, the, the, the people in my childhood, my, my, my godfathers, my parents. Oh, my gosh, sounds like the Oscars, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> books, books, other designers, you know, a yep. library of books. Is there one, would you say, at all? I mean, it's a tricky one. I couldn't say that there's been one person. It's a really, really tricky... No, I, I don't think there is one person. I think that would just be too... That would be to exclude every, everything else. But it's not just people. It's also very abstract. You know, influences can be books or just a desire. A desire to create, I think. A need. A need to create. I think that's probably the biggest influence. What would you say has tested you most so far? Tiny little moments when you just sit and think, maybe it's just after a big project mm -hmm. or when you've created a design that you're quite satisfied with. And I think, I think writers mention this a lot. They put down the pen on the final chapter or the final edit and they think, is there anything left in me? And that's, that's a really scary moment. And that, that, you know, that a few years ago, that, 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 that was quite scary. But luckily, now I understand that during the process of creation, there are actually lots of other little ideas that are germinating and you've got to write them down and put them aside because they are your next step. That's the scariest moment. The fear that you will never have an idea again. That's scary. It's happened one or two times and uh, I wouldn't want to go there again. It's really terrifying. How do you shift it if it happens? You just grit your teeth and you just know that it's a moment. And that's if it is nonsense. And of course, you'll have other ideas. <laughs> you just have to believe. It's funny. I've never thought about that side of things at all. <laughs> really interesting, Lizzie. Really interesting. Well, I just, I, I, just, I was just listening to an author once. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, I, that, I'd never thought of it myself until they mentioned it. I thought, that's what that fear was. Now, I, I know what that's like. But I could never put my finger on it. Do you ever have an inner critic, that sort of negative internal monologue at all? That's interesting that you should put those two words together because I don't think a critic is, 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 is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that's objective. Mm -hmm. And if you do see within a piece of work something that doesn't resonate, something that's not quite right, you can be damn sure that everybody else can see it too. So I don't think it's negative. I think the inner critic or even... External criticism is always very, very important to take on board, especially if it's from somebody that you trust, somebody you respect. I think external is, but the sort of inner one is when you have a sort of voice saying, you shouldn't be doing this, you should be doing yeah. that. Why did you? It's a sort of driver, I suppose. Yeah, and I, I think you should really trust it. Do you? I, I think, yeah, I, I really do. I, I just in my case, if, if, if I'm doing something and think this isn't right, it's because it isn't right. I, go, I do trust myself. <laughs> I suppose after a while you start, you, you start to. So do you think your critic is your sort of 
your gut feeling. Yes. Is that how you see it? Yes, absolutely. You just know. I think you, when you do something for a very long time, you know what's going to work and what doesn't. And if that little voice, and you're trying to ignore it, because it's much easier to ignore it, just plow on through. No, it's, this is fine. This is fine. It looks great. And there's that little voice saying, uh-uh, no. <laughs> you know this isn't right. You know it. And you might as well just unpick it and start. Not start again, but unpick it to the point when that voice kicked in and then take the right, the correct route. Do you, I mean, I think you appear to have high standards. Does that add extra pressure to you? No, I think it gives you really strong parameters to work with then. I think that's actually much easier. If you don't have an idea of where you need to push your design or your piece or your piece of work towards, you could just, that, that's when it all becomes woolly at the edges and nothing really gets formed. You know, the, the harder the parameters, the, the more limited the parameters in which you have to work, the better the work is, I, th I, I believe. I really do. Do you ever doubt yourself? Less and less. Gosh, I'd really sound like a proper big head. Yeah, I was going to say, this is incredible. It, no, it's, it's, I don't think it's big headedness because I think if you really do set a quite strict parameter and that you're, you're, you're not messing around, um, I think you just get to trust yourself when you get to a certain age. You, you just... And if you don't, then you turn to somebody who you do trust and say, well, what do you think of this? I, I think you also can permit yourself to create a lot of things and throw away 90% of them. It's not the end of the world. You know, you've got 12, 15, 18 hours a day to work. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if some things get left by the, you know, the side or they never, never turn into anything. It doesn't matter. There's loads more. Would you say that anything has ever sort of slipped by you in life that you regret? Oh, lots of things have slipped by, but you can't regret them. There's absolutely no point. You know, the time you sit there regretting, you could be making something better. It's just, you know, it's pointless. It's absolutely pointless. You can only regret or maybe feel sad and hope that you never do something again if it's something that, you've, um, that has hurt somebody in, in any other, other respect professionally. No, you can't. You just didn't take that. You didn't take that path. You can't take them all. What would you say that you've learned about yourself? That I'm tougher than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an old cantagorous woman. <laughs> a sassy cookie. Oh, that's very kind. Cantagorous <laughs> old biddy. I'm a battle axe. There you go. Bring back the battle axe. I'm sure you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody thinks I am. <laughs> no, I really, I, I, think, oh. I would think you'd have to change on that one. Okay, quick fire <laughs> round before yes. we tuck into a very exciting chocolate break. Optimist, yes. pessimist. Optimist. Introvert, extrovert or ambivert? Well, I had to look that one up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And, wow, well, I thought I was an introvert, but I think I'm an, uh, as I'm older, ambivert. Perfectionist or non-perfectionist? Non-perfectionist. Right. Night owl or early bird? Oh, my gosh, early bird. If I'm not in bed by nine, I am a wreck. So now we are tucking into our chocolate break. And this <gasps> lovely listeners is really exciting because oh, yes. I have never tasted one of these before. And I was too embarrassed to go into the shop to buy one. So I've got three. And Lizzie, I got six. Yes, Liz has got six. So she's <laughs> outdoing me. And I'm going to ask you to pronounce okay. it, Lizzie, because your pronunciation is so red hot. Um, oh, my gosh. I've just got a complete blank now. It's called Perle Framboise. Is that right? Ah, yes, what we're about to eat. And the company is? Leonidas. <laughs> Leonidas. Go. Now, yeah, it's to, to, shall I, do you want to, exp I mean, you're, you're the chocolate expert. Are you going to tell um, the listeners? No, I'm going to get you. I, I'm just going to say that this <laughs> company was set up back in 1913 by mm -hmm. the founder, Le Leonidas, in Belgium. And then I'm going to throw it back to Lizzie to say, why are we about to tuck into this? What is it? Pearl de framboise. Pearl de framboise. Oh, gosh. Framboise. This is, as you know, I was saying I was, I'm was. i a battle axe. Actually, I think I'm just an old granny. Um, <laughs> I would have never, ever, ever had something like this a few years ago. But I had a selection and I gosh, bit this into this and said, like, oh, my gosh, this is raspberry. And I felt as if I was in an Agatha Christie novel, <laughs> you know, playing bridge, eating fondant fancies. And <laughs> making sure my uh, my set my you know my set and perm was right. They've got really really thick chocolate shells. 
No, it's so sweet. I mean, but it's insane. You can only eat one a day. It is sweet. Well, Lizzie's only on one one a week, so she's got six weeks supply. I know. I'd be interested to check in with her after six weeks to see if she's <laughs> held out. I've, I, in Lizzie's book, I've got three weeks supply, but I would say by the end of today, they might disappear. Okay, Lizzie, back to work while you're still yes, eating. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on the words success and failure? Mm, I think failure is more interesting than success. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, coming back to the grit, failure does make you reflect on what you've done well or haven't achieved well and how to do it better. Success is just a byproduct. If it does happen, that's wonderful. I think failure is far more, far more interesting. Do you think that we need success, though, to keep us going when we hit yes, the failures? I mean, yeah. Yes, you, you need a bit of the carrot, but you need much more of the stick. How do you cope with failure? Well, I think I'm pretty well because it happens every day. It happens every day. You know, a design doesn't work, something doesn't work, a project doesn't come off. You know, every day there's a failure. You know, the coffee machine breaks down. <laughs> there's a failure every day. You just, you just live with it. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. Do you, you think you, that you, comes with age? I don't know how old you are, Lizzie, and you might not want to share for, it. No, 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 I'm 47. Okay, you're a spring chicken. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, well, I'm only 50, only three uh, years older. But, uh, but do you think that this is, your insights have come with age and experience? Oh, I think so. I think, I think when you're younger, you really do, well, hopefully you expect that everything is going to slot into place and then you learn that some things just don't. And that's okay. It's absolutely fine. It really is fine. I mean, unless it's catastrophic and it takes you years to get over. I mean, some things are catastrophic. Um, I've been quite lucky for nothing like that to happen to me yet, or it may never happen. I don't know. You know, the little failures happen every day and you just get used to them. It's completely normal. It's part of life. It does come with age. And, and I think getting older is one of the most wonderful things in the world. It really is. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you with mm. that. Is that, I mean, okay, there are some downsides as one's body migrates Outside. southwards. Oh. But, but, the, but the thing is that your insights are so valuable and you don't... Mm. I used to get really fizzed up about stuff and I used to get yep. so stressed about things. And now mm -hmm. you just think, you know what, it's all going to be okay. It is mm -hmm. okay. You're yep. where you're at because you need to be where you're at. And you know that if it's a bit bumpy, it's going to smooth down again. Exactly. Everything is cyclical. You know, nothing lasts forever. It's fine. It will pass. It will pass. And I think it also teaches you an incredible empathy with the world, with people. Yep, totally. So how important is incorporating well-being into your day? And do you think that you managed to achieve it? It's incredibly important. In fact, I've always consider myself a not very active person, which I suppose in retrospect is not true. Um, but you're always striving to better yourself, I suppose. Um, it all really started when I, I think <laughs> stupidly was trying to demonstrate a forward roll on a campsite to my then two-year-old child, <laughs> which really, after a certain age, you shouldn't do that or trampolining for that matter. And I think I gave myself a a quite a bad slipped disc and that was giving me real jip. Uh, tried various methods and then came across bar work which is the movements and exercises I would imagine a dancer warms their body up with and you know there's no prancing around <laughs> not at my age and not being a and not being a professional but I found that that was an incredible exercise for the entire body through breathing as well, which is incredibly important. And yes, I do that five to six times a week. And I fit it in either first thing in the morning or in the evenings and at weekends. And it does slip in seamlessly with my work life. But then again, I have the privilege of being able to choose my hours. But it's, it's so important. I don't think I've missed a session in over, God two, three years now. Wow. Is it possible to do that from home? I mean, presumably oh, because yes. of lockdown, you're doing it from home. But yes. would you normally be going to a class or how does it work? Yeah, yes, I, I would go to a class maybe only once a week. And in fact, um, the lockdown allowed our little community to meet practically every day. And a lot of us have chosen to ask our tutors, wonderful teachers, if we could continue that way. Well, there will obviously be some more 
face to face, but um, the technology has allowed for the teachers to be able to correct the, the, the postures of their students. And our community has actually held us together really strongly. And that's been incredibly important for a lot of people's mental well-being as well during this, um, this difficult period. So, Lizzie, how do you take time out? I mean, I know that um, we've chatted about how you basically are on thinking about it, you and Tim, most of your day and night. But how do you just stop and just reset yourself? <laughs> By doing another activity. I don't know, <laughs> baking, baking. I'm, I'm an absolute, I'm a, I, gosh, the, the, my, uh, the beauty of my creations is uh, very, very dubious. Taste-wise, they're okay. But I do that day in, day out. It's my other, it's just a, a different way of approaching things. It's a, just a d different way of your brain to approach um, making something. You're following instructions this way. And then when you finally understand, you can start improvising a little bit. It's a very different um, way of approaching, yes, creating something. So it's either that or, or, or more work or tapestry work. I've been learning to weave tapestry for a, a few years now. And that's also become incredibly important to me. So there's no sort of, you know, sitting down on the sofa and completely disconnecting. There's always something to do and it's exciting. It's fun. It's so much fun just doing stuff. It is. It's that thing of, of learning, isn't it? And the sort of, I mean, I used to do um, tapestry cushions. I used to love tapestry. Oh. I found it really yep. therapeutic and so satisfying at the end. Yeah. Yep. to see your finished thing. And, and usually I'd make them into cushions and just give them to friends because I've sort of seen them enough over <laughs> doing the work. But it, it's just, I actually am a mentor for um, fine cell work. I don't oh, know if, I love them. Yes, yeah. I've met them. They're wonderful. Amazing. And um, I, I mentor on the sort of Open the Gate programme. Oh, uh, but, you know, they're, they're, it was their window display that just pulled yes. me in. I thought, I've got to find out mm -hmm. more when they had their pop-up shop in um, Pimlico. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Lizzie, what would you say triggers your stress and how does it affect you physically, mentally, spiritually? Um, I find, strangely, um, travel. The prospect of travel, mm -hmm. incredibly stressful. I don't, I really can't explain why. Nothing's ever gone wrong. I have no idea. But the prospect of travel, uh, usually on my own, really, really messes things up. And that will continue until I'm back home. Not that I don't enjoy it. And I always have a wonderful time and nothing goes wrong. And it's always very productive. But I, I, I have no idea. It's just, I think it's, anything outside of the control things could happen it's utterly ridiculous and i have to learn to let go of that it's not productive so it's not something specific where it's making sure you get the right clothes or getting your flight or finding your way or when you land it's everything it's all of those it's all of those little things getting there on time not finding a taxi yeah forgetting something <laughs> what it's if? Just, they're, they're, uh, yes the what ifs which are utterly ridiculous and utterly irrational and have never happened. So I'll work on that. <laughs> Do you um, have a daily ritual at all? Yes, absolutely. I let myself wake up. So I usually wake up around, I don't know, half past five, six, just gently wait for the, the, the sound of the coffee machine gurgling upstairs, <laughs> drag half an eyeball upstairs, pour the coffee, and then refill the hot water bottle, shove it behind the neck, prop myself up and just inhale the coffee, sip the coffee and, yes, ease myself with uh, gratitude and joy into the day. Well, the hot water bottle sounds fascinating. Oh, it's wonderful. Hot is forever. They're the best. <laughs> so you do, I, I mean, I love them. I usually put them between my knees because I yep. find that helps the circulation. Certainly in the winter, I have a hat on my head mm -hmm. and yes. a hot water yes. bottle between my knees and thick socks. But what are you, do you have a little mini hot water bottle? I'm just intrigued by this. I have many so that they are, they're, <laughs> they're all knitted. God, that was the, the, the massive knitting phase of my life. Uh, no, there's many there. D d different textures, different softness from different parts of the body. God, this is so lame. So granny. But hold on, what are you doing? So what are you doing to your neck? What is the, what is this daily ritual about? It, it, it warms up the, the, the back of the shoulders. 
because there's a lot of tension there, especially yeah. with uh, not only the weaving work, but the yeah. needlepoint tapestry work, and then being hunched over, you know, the drawing or yeah. hunched over a computer screen. So there's a lot of tension there. I'm sure that most of us suffer from that, but that just eases it off, warms it up, and it's incredibly comforting. It's, it's all about comfort. It's about being enveloped and sort of a bit of self-love. I must give that a whirl. Do you sleep quite easily and quite well? Uh, it takes me about an hour to drift off. Wow. Um, and then I'll usually wake up half past one on the dot just to check in for some <laughs> reason and and then drift, drift back off. But, oh, I tell you, a good mattress and a good topper are a big, big secret to good sleep. I know sleep we should really invest in more because it's so important to our well-being. Oh, it's, I mean, it's been dismissed for so long as if it's, you know, something that losers do. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's something that hopefully well-rounded individuals understand because it's, well, it's obviously we know that sleep deprivation is a form of torture. Um, it's impossible to function. It really is. And it's, it's, it's detrimental and it's ridiculous to dismiss it. Yeah, it is. I mean, now there's so much talk about it. I think that people are realising the how successful your life can be, or not successful, but how much better and more rounded your life can be by having a good night's sleep. Well, it's, your your brain needs to needs to construct dreams. It needs to work things out. It needs to plough through problems. And uh, without sleep, you can't do that. And you're just going to get yourself into a real mental tiz. So, Lizzie, what music makes you feel good and what book would you miss if it wasn't on your bookshelf? Oh, I'm just looking at my bookshelf now. Well, music, there's, I mean, obviously wide variety, really wide variety, but there's one particular piece that I can listen to when I'm happy or sad or anxious. There's just one piece and it's uh, the music for the birthday of Queen Mary by Purcell, uh, followed by her funeral. <laughs> there you go. And it's... It's extraordinary. It is such an extraordinary piece of early Baroque music. I just, I, I don't know. It transcends everything. It's just, it's, it's just mind blowing. And I would highly recommend anybody to just listen to that. Just listen properly. Just close everything off and just listen to that piece of music. And a book, a book, a book, a book. Oh my gosh, which one have I read again and again and again? I think I've, I think it would just be Parole by Prévert. His his uh, uh, his poems. Parole. It means word, doesn't it? It means words. It's quite quite simply words. Some some poems are no more than four lines. Some oh. many pages. They're 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 quite. Some are quite political. Some are very profound. Some are just very poetic and beautiful and romantic. That he's quite incredible, incredible poet. So where have you had to have had hope and also patience? Well, I think as you, you mentioned earlier, you know, that we have been through some real bumps mm -hmm. worldwide now, twice over in, in, you know, in less than 15 years. Mm -hmm. The hope is that, as you said, things will smooth out, things will get better again. You know, you, you, you do have to live with that hope. And patience in the daily, I think, patience is, is daily. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary that the, the name of your company came from people's names. And I, I wonder if they actually lived up to the names they have. They were very special women. Actually, they did. They were in Hope was small and round, mm -hmm. very talented artist. Yes. And she was always optimistic. And mm -hmm. Patience was tall and slim and a real doer. I mean, she, her husband, my grandfather, was in very mm -hmm. successful in the army. He was away a lot. She brought up her three children. She got oh a school goodness. on the go. You know, she was just, she was incredible. She was a big warrior. Mm -hmm. But um, I think they were very traditional names in, in those days. Yes, absolutely. Well, th there you go, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you, you have to have hope and patience daily, you know, for different things. In, in big or small amounts. I think they're, they're, they're incredible things to have. And have you got, can you give examples of a, an instance where it could be business, it could be personal, where you've just had to really hang on to hope and also realise that the only way to get through it is to have dollop loads of patience? Yes, I mean, I think business-wise, you. I, th I think you live with that. I mean, I'm, uh, you would, I'm sure, concur that... You know that you hope that this big project that's so exciting is going to happen. Is going mm -hmm. to happen. Then you have to have the patience every day just for for it to fall into place and you know resolve itself and to materialize or not. I think yes, absolutely. 
Would you say that you've had to have more of one or the other to lead to the success of Fromentel? I would say patience is probably the better. Sometimes hope can kill you. <laughs> if you pin, if, well, because you're pinning something on something completely exterior. Patience is something that you can cultivate yourself mm-hmm. and that you can apply yourself. Hope is really pinning, pinning everything on an outside influence. You know, patience is within yourself. That's probably the most important for me. What advice would you give, Lizzie, to people who are thinking up setting up their own business or perhaps in the early stages or others who, who are just needing a bit of a pep? Well, I was going to say, don't be realistic. Seriously, wow. just, yes, don't be realistic because that'll just put you off. I mean, the first few years are incredibly tough mm. and you just can't be a realist. You have to be an absolute dreamer as long as you apply yourself and you work incredibly hard and you know that you're good at what you do then don't be a realist. Just just dream. Dream big. Just do it. And again, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. You've learned a huge amount. You've learned that what, uh, you know, what is not possible, what is possible, what you could have done better. Just don't be a realist. Don't ever have your feet on the ground. Just let, let yourself go. Go for it. Excellent, Lizzie. So <laughs> where can our lovely listeners find out more about you, hear the latest, your website, Instagram? Yes, well, well we are on Instagram and I think it's uh, a, a good platform. At Fromental Design. Fromental Design is a good platform for all things visual. It is gorgeous. It is <laughs> No, but it, I pop on it every now and again just to have a, that whole sort of absorption thing of something just utterly divine. It really oh. gets you going. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and our our website is also obviously very visual because that is what we're selling. We're selling, you know, things to feast on with the eyes. (laughs) So, yes, there, 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 I would say have a look there and come and see us when everything is better. We're in London. We have a lovely showroom. And, um, yeah, we've got wonderful people working with us, all of which share a real passion for beauty. So there you go. There you go. So, Lizzie, I would like to say the hugest of thank yous. I feel I could chat with you for <laughs> hours and we've never chatted before. And No, we haven't. It's, it's wonderful. Just, it's such a treat. And when I start the podcast, you're on my list of, I've got to have Lizzie on the show. Oh. And well, your chocolate has been so wonderful. And it's made so many of our clients so very happy. Well, that carton, I mean, <laughs> I need to dig out the images. You might have them. They were, It was just the most sublime carton. And I just oh. thought, oh, my goodness, I wish that I'd had them to design all my cartons but such a treat and I'm very pleased that I've been introduced to the Pearl de Fom- <laughs> Framboise Framboise I think it's just called Pearl de Framboise Framboise or oh, Milk Raspberry Ganache oh, Milk Raspberry <laughs> Ganache lovely anyway thank you thank you Lizzie for coming on the show it has been a real treat thank you Amelia thank you very much Anyway, before I go, it's time for my recommendation, which today is a food and also the quote for the episode. So my food recommendation is for you to go and grab a bag of pecan nuts, break them up into smaller pieces, pop them in a pan and just gently roast them, sprinkle some Morden sea salt on them, leave them to cool and you've got a brilliant snack. It's great for your immunity, skin, anti-aging, anti-inflammatory and much more. They're high in zinc vitamin E, vitamin A, calcium, magnesium, and they've got a slight sweetness to them. So they, they're yummy. I put them in salads, everything. And the quote is by one of my favourite artists, Matisse, creativity takes courage. A huge thank you for finding the show. I hope you enjoyed the chat. Don't forget to subscribe to get the latest episode. And if you're enjoying the show, it would be truly fab if you could rate and review it, or better still, share it with folk who may value a gem or two. Any recommendations, quotes, songs can be found in the show notes and on the website too. Until the next time, however tough these times get, keep that very special inner sparkle you have shining. Hope and Patience with Amelia Rope. Join the conversation at hopeandpatience.co.uk. Find Amelia on Facebook at Hope and Patience or on Twitter and Instagram at Amelia underscore Rope.